if you want to take over the world or whatever your ultimate ambition is, you can't do it alone if you want the best results. But we gotta join forces, man. Whether that means making sure your relationship with your nemesis is as toxic as possible. I hate you. Or that your teamwork with your fellow bad guys is top of the line. It's all up to you. I'm Keefe Nosi with Wicked Binge and this is Illumination Villain Relationships, Healthy to Toxic. With that said, let's dive right on in. These are the healthy relationships. And honestly, flaws aside, we couldn't give the gold medal of health to anything but the relationship between Gru and the girls. Now, on the off chance that this is surprising, let us explain. Before anything else, it's definitely worth noting that their relationship didn't start healthy. Go away, I'm not home! Initially, Gru only adopted Margot, Edith, and Agnes to use them to distract Vector so he could steal his shrink right back. Not only does this count as serious child endangerment, but it's just really mean in general. Well, I suppose the plan will work with two. As for how we justify putting this bond at the top regardless, Gru's relationship with his new daughters is what pushed him to put away his evil schemes and become a good guy. He gets so distracted by his new bond with the Garls that Dr. Nefario has them taken away so he won't lose sight of his plans. Ultimately, Gru rescues them in the end and becomes a true dad to the three of them. And even beyond this redemption arc, they help him out too. They've assisted in rescuing him when he's the one who needs saving and even played a small part in setting him up with his wife, Lucy. That sort of turnaround is enough to warrant the top spot on our list. Gru even wrote his literary masterpiece, One Big Unicorn. I who wrote this? Oh, me! Thanks to the familial love he learned about. Our runner-up position goes to the relationship between Snowball and the flushed pets. Look, Snowball might be the closest thing to a villain this movie has, but there's no denying his loyalty to his gang. Having been abandoned by his magician owner, Snowball adapted to life in the sewers with other abandoned pets, from a pig destined for slaughter to the dearly departed Ricky, the only one who'd kill a human on sight. You sold your head! That was ready to kill humans on sight! It's crystal clear that Snowball cares deeply for all of his comrades. When Max and Duke accidentally get Viper killed by falling debris during their wood be initiation, Snowball is devastated and vows revenge on the two. Say what you will about his gang activities, but Snowball is at the very least a trustworthy leader who sincerely cares for his followers. He may be an underground criminal and potential murderer. It's back to our primary mission, the downfall of the human race. But he at least has the compassion to take anyone he believes as a stray under his wing, including Max and Duke, but before their lie was exposed. That said, it's worth wondering what their relationship is like now that Snowball is a pet again, but if you ask us, we're pretty sure his old crew would accept him. From the depths of the sewers to the top of a mountain, next up is the Grinch and Max. Even bad guys need friends, and while this iteration of the Grinch is a little less dastardly than usual, the same sentiment applies. Max is as loyal a dog as they come, serving as the Grinch's loyal minion and friend no matter what. The reason this iconic duo still finds itself a couple of spots below the top is the fact that the Grinch can admittedly be sort of mean to Max. From reprimanding him for joining in his organ solo to cheating at a game of chess against him, it never gets too harsh though, and, and the amount of loyalty Max holds for his master more than makes up for it, as does the Grinch's admittedly limited soft spot for him. All right, all right, I'm sorry. Speaking of loyalty, next we have the relationship between the minions and their allies. While Kevin, Bob, Stuart, and Otto, I guess, are the most notable, the minions all seem to get along pretty well with each other, sometimes excluding Otto for some reason. We're not sure we'd describe it as a hive mind or anything, but we're not sure we wouldn't describe it as one either. At worst, the minions will fight like little kids, which makes sense given that that's about their level of intelligence, but at best, they're great partners in crime, literally or otherwise. They're loyal to each other and to anyone who helps them in their efforts, and if they're devoted to serving you, they'll see you through no matter what, even if it means contributing their own funds to your next evil scheme. Well, they're loyal with one exception. If you step away from super villainy, they're not guaranteed to stick around. But everyone has standards, right? You can't expect them to work for you if you aren't killing people. I mean, come on, employers these days. This one may be a shock, but next we have a truly villainous duo, Scarlet and Herb Overkill from the Minions. There's something endlessly appealing about an evil couple who are absolutely horrific to everyone around them, but still show love to each other even if that extends to nobody else. Scarlet and Herb represent this dynamic pretty much perfectly. I, I mean, sure, Herb is by far the less malicious of the two, which can often lead to Scarlet's frustration, but they're always loyal to each other and stick together no matter what. It's worth noting that Scarlet is probably the most outright evil character in the Despicable Me universe. Gotta look good for the public. <sighs> and while her healthy marriage doesn't make that any less true, it's at least one good quality in a sea of constant crime and atrocities. As for Herb, his devotion to his wife is never a question, even if he's friends and more approachable, you'd still better beware when they're in the same room. 
For the last of our fully healthy relationships, we have the friendship between Snowball and Max. Really, this could almost be considered a representation for Snowball's relationship with pets in general. As we can tell by his own backstory and by his actions in the sequel, Snowball doesn't actually hate pets. He hates the deadbeat owners who abandoned them to turn them into strays. Thrown away by our owners, and now we're out for revenge! When he finds out Max and Duke are pets, and further still, that they played a hand in Viper's death, he vows revenge and tries to kill them, which doesn't exactly speak to the better side of their relationship. Thankfully, when he finds a loving owner again, Snowball reforms his ways and becomes a hero. And on top of that, point me in the direction of any animal who needs my help and stand back! Even becomes friends with Max and the rest of the pets, with the two of them working together to rescue Who from Sergei. It's honestly pretty impressive that the two of them were able to put the past behind them so quickly. They didn't even feel the need to discuss the fact that Snowball tried to kill Max multiple times, and as we all know, that's the sign of a true blue friendship. Abrupt though it may be. But not every villain gets blessed with such good comrades, nor even redemption arcs. These are the questionable relationships. First up is the surprisingly wholesome relationship between Wild Knuckles and Gru. Anyone who's familiar with the Despicable Me series knows that Gru's relationship with his parents is anything but healthy. He hardly knows his father, and his mother is fairly open about how much of a disappointment he is to her. When it comes to his parental units, the bar is on the floor for poor Gru. That's precisely why his idol supervillain, Wild Knuckles, manages to land in the middle category rather than where logic would usually dictate. In Minions Rise of Gru, Gru is kidnapped by Wild Knuckles to use as leverage in order to get back the Zodiac Stone as ransom, not knowing Otto had already traded it for a pet rock. While the guy's gotta lose some points for torturing a literal child, actually, now that I'm reading that out loud, he should lose a lot of points for that, but ultimately, Wild Knuckles ends up taking Gru under his wing and becoming a sort of father-slash-older brother figure to him. Wait till you see what I'm gonna teach you next! I cannot wait! He even saves Gru's life from the other members of the Vicious Six with some help from the minions, and after he escapes from prison, they reunite to enjoy some good old-fashioned supervillainy in his final years. Next up is another of Gru's relationships, the relationship between Gru and Dr. Nefario. Acting as Gru's right-hand man and weapons manufacturing scientist, Dr. Nefario is one of Gru's most reliable allies. Even if his tendency to misunderstand Gru's directions can sometimes cause trouble, there's definitely an unspoken respect between these two, and it's been there for a pretty long time given that Gru actually met Nefario as a young child and followed through on his old promise to remember who helped him find the Vicious Six for his interview. That said, while Dr. Nefario is a great partner in evil schemes, he can sometimes fall short when it comes to, well, anything else. He ends up getting the girls taken away from Gru when he suspects that they're endangering his mission. While you could argue that this was to help Gru with his job, it still went directly against his friend's wishes and greatly jeopardized his relationship with the girls, which was ultimately what made him a better person. Even Nefario's loyalty can waver, like when he briefly left Gru in favor of becoming El Macho's henchman, but amends were made if nothing else. Let's open our next entry with a question mankind has pondered for ages. How bad can the relationship between the Once and the Lorax be? Well, it can be pretty bad, like 6 out of 10 on a good day. Yeah, bad. Right. The story of the Lorax is well known, and perpetually relevant. The one slur harvests the truffula trees for his new invention. This is much to the dismay of the kindly Lorax, who speaks for the trees. After attempting to send the one slur down the river to get him out of the forest, ironically not, to kill him, the Lorax and him strike a truce, with the one slur saying that he'll only harvest the tufts of the trees so as to not hurt them in the process. While initially the one slur befriends the Lorax and the other forest creatures, he falls back into his own ways thanks to his honestly awful family pushing him to start cutting the trees down again. We could always start chopping down the trees. This totally destroys the forest, leaving the Lorax and his animal friends homeless, betrayed, and devastated. The only thing holding this relationship back from landing in full-on toxic territory is the fact that the Onceler feels sincere remorse for his misdeeds, offering Ted advice and supplies to help bring back trees to Thneedville. Gradually, the environment heals, and as we see at the end of the movie, so does the relationship between the Lorax and the Onceler. It's nice to know that they were able to make amends, and hopefully future generations won't make the same mistake, and they even have matching mustaches. Mustaches. That's at least got to keep them out of the toxic category. By the way, nice mustache. On that note, our last relationship before we enter the toxic territory is the not very brotherly bond between Felonius and Drew Gru. This one is a bit of a doozy. Whereas Gru is an extremely capable villain who's left that life behind. I left that life behind me. End of story. Drew is the opposite. Teach me the art of villainy. While he desperately wants to be a proper supervillain like his long lost brother, he's also a total klutz. 
Despite their differences, the two are able to form a decent bond as the movie goes on, until Drew realizes that Gru's only been working with him on heists to get his and Lucy's AVL jobs back. We are no longer brothers! That's fine with me! To Drew's credit, he's mature enough to place his fight with Gru to the side when he finds out that their nieces have been kidnapped by Balthazar Brat. They work together with Lucy to save the girls from his clutches, and while they're still very different people, they still have a sort of familial bond between them. Drew even steals Gru's ship as part of a family tradition, to which the former is nice enough to give him a head start. Honey, he's my brother! We'll give him a five minute head start. It's not exactly the most stable relationship given that their careers directly juxtapose each other, but these two do care about each other at the end of the day. Though often it's at the very tail end of the day. Now, without further ado, let's get to the real stars of the video. These dastardly connections are the toxic relationships. First up is the relationship between Mayor O'Hare and Ted from the Lorax. Honestly, O'Hare's relationship with Ted isn't much better nor worse than his relationship with anyone else in Thneedville. Excuse me down there. I don't care who you are, you little crazy baby man, get out of my house. The guys managed to create a monopoly on breathing, after all, and while Mr. Krabs would be proud, most of his citizens aren't. Or more so, they're initially too dense to tell him how awful his system is. The reason we're placing a relationship this slow is the fact that Ted was ultimately the one who finally threatened to topple O'Hare's empire, and furthermore, he became the target of O'Hare's ruthlessness when it comes to staying on top. Still, this one's at the top of the category because this was less of a personal grudge as much as it was O'Hare being an atrocious human being. Oh, Aloysius. W wait, he is human, right? Dr. Seuss is weird about that. You have been warned. Somehow the relationship between the chef and the Mallard family in Migration manages to be more personal than our last entry. This one is more or less self-explanatory. The chef is running a tight ship at his high-end restaurant where he serves delicacies like duck à l'orange. It's you with l'orange on top. Ooh. The Mallards are ducks. That could basically be a mic drop, but it's worth noting that Chef held enough of a grudge against these birds to kidnap them alongside the ones he purchased from Gugu's resort. We get that the food chain is a thing, but even in that context, the Chef has absolutely no respect for the animals he counts on to keep his restaurant afloat. That said, you've gotta wonder how much trauma he's going to have from being essentially destroyed by a cave full of birds with human intelligence. Not saying he didn't deserve it, but I mean, we can't pretend anything about this was healthy. Up next, we have a classic case of nepotism, the relationship between Carlos and the bunnies from Hop. Man, I've heard of chicks not getting recognition in the workplace, but this is ridiculous. Where's my laugh track? But seriously, it, it kind of is. Carlos's frustration is understandable to an extent. He's been working alongside the bunnies for ages, and he wants a chance to be the Easter Bunny, even though he's, you know, a chick. Even a humble chick could uh, do the job. While this might seem like it could work out really well since E.B. didn't really want to be the Easter Bunny at first and Carlos had both the experience and desire, Mr. Bunny shut it down. Little did he know this was the last straw for Carlos. He totally usurped Easter and with his fellow chicks in tow, managed to become the first ever Easter abomination. I mean, chick. Oh, Jess, well, look at me wielding. I'm wielding. Uh-oh, I'm wielding it again. Okay. We can at least sympathize with his frustration, if nothing else, but his willingness to overthrow and betray his longtime companions says a lot to his lack of morality. There's no business like show business, but no business would be better than the business between Jimmy Crystal and Buster Moon. While Buster is a decent guy when all is said and done, he's definitely lacking when it comes to learning his lesson. Case in point, Sing 2, where he tells the ruthless Jimmy Crystal that he can get the famous long lost musician Clay Calloway to perform for him at their concert. Oh, that'd be huge for me. Huge. When Jimmy finds out that this was a lie, he's reasonably ticked off, but his threat to throw Buster off the roof of a building for displeasing him was maybe a bit too far. The reason we're placing this one so low is because while Jimmy is undeniably a villain with few reservations when it comes to violence and even murder, Buster wasn't innocent either. While he did intend to get Calloway to perform, he didn't have a guarantee at first, making this a repeat of his scheme in the first movie, but actually more egregious. Long story short, they both did each other dirty and have earned a pretty low spot as a result. Next up, we have the age old tale of of villain versus former villain, El Macho and Gru. Their relationship is the furthest thing from deep or complex. What was once a case of Gru admiring El Macho's legendary villain status has flipped on its head. The reverse card in question has turned into El Macho admiring Gru and offering him a chance to join forces with him. We could have ruled the world together, Gru only for the latter to reject it due to his newly reformed ways. Given that El Macho threatened to send Gru's eventually to the wife into a volcano, it's no surprise that there would be some bad blood between them, but you just can't beat the original. Next up is the villain on villain relationship between Gru and Vector. While well, you could almost describe Gru and Vector's relationship as a business rivalry, they're both willing to break the rules to get ahead of each other. This is understandable since 
you know, their business is super villainy, but stealing Guru's possessions and eventually even his family is taking things a few steps too far. The only thing keeping these two from falling any lower is that the relationships below them are somehow significantly worse. While there's never not going to be bad blood between these two, they really do look like business rivals in comparison, and rounding out the original Despicable Me trilogy's villains, next up is Balthazar Brat and Hollywood. Okay, maybe this one's a stretch, but just think about it. Balthazar Brat has been tormenting the world for ages. His entire TV show was about committing crimes, but when he stopped being cute enough for the cameras, he got a bit too into his character. I'm canceling you and all the losers who rejected me! His plan was to make Hollywood literally float out into space as revenge for his cancellation. Thankfully, Gru and company were able to stop him, but we had to give Brat a quick mention for just how detrimental his time in the spotlight was to his mental state. We're not trying to make him into a sympathetic villain, but imagine your whole life being defined by people watching your evil antics on television only to one day be told you're not cute enough for it anymore. No wonder he'd do anything to get it back, but unfortunately pity doesn't take away gravity from his misdeeds. Up next is an all-time classic. We've got the relationship between Bowser and the good guys. Yeah, while we could easily single out his relationships with each of the movie's main characters, Bowser proved himself perfectly inhumane towards all of Mario's friends, and Mario. He kidnapped Luigi and plucked his hairs from his mustache, tried to force Peach into a marriage by threatening a toad's life, and Mario is, well, it's Mario and Bowser, but more needs to be said there. Now, call us crazy for this, but we're going to bet that this hatred is far from one-sided. The Mushroom Kingdom is not going to be welcoming the Koopa King back with open arms anytime soon. That said, at least it's to be expected that the heroes and villains would hate each other, and to Bowser's credit, he does love Prince says Peach in his own incredibly twisted, messed up way. Of course she hates me, but that makes me love her all the more. We sadly can't extend the same charity to Bowser and Comic, and really all of his minions. Not only will Bowser incinerate his minions without hesitation if they even say something he doesn't like, but he constantly berates and abuses them, showing basically no appreciation for all they do for him. True to his game counterpart, he's also absolutely awful to poor Comic. Magic or not, getting a piano's cover shut on your fingers cannot be a very fun time. It's made significantly worse by the fact that, in the games at least, Comic raised Bowser from infancy. It's one thing to be cruel to your adversaries, but you guys are straight up family. Hopefully Bowser Jr. can make his debut in the sequel and give Bowser some healthy relationship representation, because right now the Koopa King is not holding the best reputation. Up next we have the absolutely treacherous timeline of Wild Knuckles and the Vicious Six, or five now, technically. We get it, Wild Knuckles is getting up there in years and you don't want him to be holding the team back on more dangerous heists, but that does nothing to justify how absolutely dirty his so-called friends did him. You guys really sent this elderly man into a dangerous booby-trapped tomb to get the Zodiac stone only to take it for yourselves and knock him off your ship to presumably die. Thankfully, Wild Knuckles survived and eventually redeemed himself by helping save Gru from the remaining five, giving the audience some much needed catharsis in the process. But the absolute betrayal here is pretty biting, even for a character we'd only known for five minutes when it happened. Where's your loyalty? Oh, please, we're villains. <laughs> There's no such thing. We're entering the bottom three now. The Bronze Medal of Toxicity goes to Sergei and Hu from The Secret Life of Pets 2. We'll give Sergei some credit in one area, honesty. This man is a piece of trash in every way, but if nothing else, and there is nothing else, believe us, he's not trying to hide his sinister motives. Sergei is extremely abusive towards Hu, training him to perform dangerous circus tricks and threatening to harm or even kill him if he messes up. If Tiger does it's not a trick. Tiger will become rug. He even forces his wolves to hunt down Snowball for trying to help Hu out, and threatens to kill one of their own if they let him down. That's just all sorts of screwed up. To make matters worse, it's implied that Hu is a cub that is baby Tiger, so if you needed any more reason to hate Sergei, there you go, That's that one's on us. Shout out to that old lady for backing over him after running him over, just in case. The Silver Medal of Toxicity has to go to the relationship between Scarlet Overkill and the Minions. This one is somewhat saved by the Minions' loyalty to Scarlet, as you'd expect, given that serving evil masters is literally their sole ambition in life. Unfortunately, Scarlet was neither as patient nor as adaptable as grew to the Minions' chaotic nature. When they get their hands on the Queen's crown, Scarlet labels them as traitors and immediately decides to torture and kill them. I don't want you to take this the wrong way. But I hate you. But thankfully, Bob, being the absolute delight that he is, hands over the crown to appease her and correct the misconception about their loyalty. With this considered, Scarlet naturally thanks the minions by sentencing them to be tortured to death anyway. The minions quite literally did exactly what she wanted them to, and she still would have had them maimed if they weren't immortal. We definitely could have put that one in our gold medals position, but for today, 
we're giving that honor to the relationship between Mike the Mouse and the bears from Sing. So just to refresh your memory, Mike had a habit of swindling dangerous bears out of money that he knew darn well he couldn't pay them back. When that comes back to bite him in the butt, the bears also come back to bite him in the butt, threatening to eat him if he can't pay them back. So we've got a jerk who cons people out of money and a trio of gangster-esque bears who kill people who scam them. Definitely toxic, sure, but does it warrant being called the most toxic? Well, hear us out. While almost the entire cast of Sing returns for the sequel, one face is conspicuously absent, Mike the Mouse. Now let's draw your attention to the last we've seen of Mike when he's driving with his new girlfriend and a bear appears behind him maliciously smiling. You could even say he's hungrily smiling. You could even say they straight up implied that one of the main characters of this movie gets eaten alive and that's why he isn't in the sequel. Hey, cheer up, Mike. Maybe they'll bring you back in Family Guy. Ooh, or, or, or American Dad. Stop. I can't take it. Keep, keep it coming. Imagine an interaction between Roger and this little guy. If the writers are watching, that idea's on me. Rip to a real one, though.